Hello, everyone, and welcome. Welcome to Factory 45 Live, the live show for fashion entrepreneurs. We're going to give it a minute here while we get a live audience going. It always takes a couple minutes to tune in here. If you can, there we go. I'm starting to see some people. If you can see me and hear me, uh, please let me know in the chat and we'll bring our guests on very soon. There's Hannah. Awesome. Okay, so I see that see the number going up. Hi everyone. We can see and hear you. Great. All right. Very, very excited for today's guest. Um, as a reminder, this is Factory 45 Live, the live show for fashion entrepreneurs. I'm Shannon Lohr. I'm the founder of Factory 45, the online business school that takes sustainable fashion brands from idea to launch. Um, okay. Hi, everyone. I see more messages in the chat. So today I'm here with two very special guests. Kathy Hattori, the founder of Botanical Colors, and Amy Dufault, the sustainability director at Botanical Colors. Um, so if you've ever thought about or been interested in incorporating natural dyeing techniques to your fashion or accessories brand, these are two experts in the field. Like they're here with us today. I hope you guys have questions. Kathy has been working on natural dyeing in the fashion industry since... 1982. Amy has an ex extensive background across many areas of sustainability and fashion. So I'm really excited for you to hear from them today. Um, after the interview, you will have the chance to ask your own questions. So go ahead and type your questions in the ch into the chat at any time throughout the next, you know, 30 to 45 minutes. Um, but we'll go ahead and get started. I'm going to bring on Kathy and Amy here. <laughs> All right. Welcome. All right. Thank you. Thanks. So um, I'm just going to quickly have you each introduce yourselves. Kathy, maybe you can start. Sure. Kathy Hattori. I'm the president of Botanical Colors. Uh, we founded the, co the, the uh, company in 2010. But I've been working in natural dyes, as Shannon mentioned, since um, the 1980s. That just seems like such a long time. Been always fascinated with plants, color, um, the ability to create your own clothing from uh, natural resources. And right now we're working really hard on incorporating more and more sustainability initiatives into botanical colors. It's a, it's a super natural and easy, intuitive fit. So um, for that, us, that's really exciting. Um, you know, we're just, it's such a great time to be doing this type of work. And um, I'm really excited to be speaking with you today. Uh, we could talk a lot more about bio and background as we progress, but I'll turn it over to Amy. Great. Hey, my name is Amy, and uh, I guess my background is as a sustainable fashion journalist for about 15 years now. And I've known Shannon for a long time as part of that. Um, I also run a fiber shed, so I'm really interested in everything that's uh, from farmer to finished product regionally. I work with fiber sheds uh, worldwide. I've been working with Kathy, who is one of the best humans ever, for over nine years now. Uh, knew a little bit about natural dyes. I know a lot about sustainable fashion, and then the marriage of the two has been awesome. It's actually one of the most beautiful parts of the sustainable fashion industry I've ever come across. So we're excited to talk to you about um, natural dyes today. Awesome. Thank you both again for being here. Um, Kathy, how did you originally become interested in natural dyeing techniques? And I guess, why do you feel it's important for the fashion industry? Um, natural dyeing, just, I, of course I fell into it. I think <clears throat> a lot of people, I mean, sometimes people have that aha moment and they just decide, oh, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. I, I think I just fell into it because I was very interested in textiles. I had been taught to spin and we, I actually worked in high tech tech in California mm -hmm. and we were on this campus, which, um, intersected with, with private property. And as I walked from 
building to building, there was this lady who was always either weaving or spinning. And I just happened to strike up a conversation and she just happened to start teaching me how to do these kinds of things. So I was, I was sort of interested in it. But then uh, in taking a workshop, I learned that that you could actually get color instead of, you know, tearing open a, a package of writ dye, you could actually get color from stuff that was just around you on the ground or things that you could forage. And it just struck a chord with me like, wow, this is so interesting. So that's how I got started. And um, as I progressed from there, I, I realized that, wow, I just need, there's just so much more to learn. So then I began to really, even though I was working in a high tech job in telecommunications, I really began to just, you know, devote my spare time to that. And then I had a moment where the high tech job just kind of went away um, through a reorganization. And I was like, wow, do I, do I go back into technology or do I try to do something different? And, and I just want to say it's never too late. I mean, I was in my, uh, I think I was 49 years old when I made that decision. So it's not like, oops, something just dropped. <laughs> it's not like, um, uh, you know, you have to start really early and only that way you can become, you know, interested in it and do something with it. You can absolutely start at any age. And the barrier to entry, I would say, for natural dyes is pretty low. Um, you know, you can just walk outside and find something to dye with. And for brands and retailers, there's so many levels where you can participate that I would just encourage you to really think about, like, how how do you want to position your brand and what, what does that mean and where can you participate? And is that what you, did you just like start getting plants off the ground and like dying things? Like how, what did you do? First? I used to crawl around on my stomach because this, <laughs> one of my neighbors had insomnia, but she had this really cool um, plant that I read could make a purple, you know, purple's kind of hard to get in the natural dye world it, it's a it can be a very involved process so I was trying to get these these little you know berries from her plant but she was always up she was always awake because <laughs> she had insomnia so I would like crawl on my stomach just trying to you know and then I'd reach up and pick a few and then sometimes she would like come to the window and look outside you know it was dark right but oh. then I just like like that this is, until this she was is the most literal like analogy for entrepreneurship these, I've ever heard. These are the stories. You know, crawl on your stomach. <laughs> crawl on your stomach to get itself. the dye stuff to see what kind of color it's going to make. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, it literally was stuff on the ground. Um, Amy, how did you did you like meet Kathy first and then just want to work with her, her, or were you like interested in the natural dyeing world? This is this was like Amy um, 7.0. Uh, <laughs> I had one job and I had started doing some consulting, doing press, uh, well, PR and communications and events in New York mm -hmm. City. And, and Kathy and I met there. I was I was working with FIT on a, their first sustainable fashion conference. And Kathy was a speaker. So we she needed some press help. And I had just I was in the throes of being a reporter working for The Guardian and others. So yeah, so started working with Kathy and little by little, I was like, maybe I'll try those dyes out. And we actually started just like a couple things we did on the site it was called Dying for Dummies because I was such a newbie using yeah. dyes. I still am, even though it's been nine years. But yeah, I was just trying things out and I was like, this is actually really cool to do some indigo dyeing. And and the idea of to take, you know, to take your wardrobe and completely transform it just using different colors. So that was really exciting to me to think about, to think about that. And then as we worked more with, as I worked more with Kathy, when it came to designers and di different brands that we were working with, it was kind of back to the beginning of when I was working with sustainable fashion designers back in the, whatever, 2005, I think. But it was like yet another hurdle for designers to have to, jump over and understand this idea mm -hmm. of how the like the pace of of natural dyeing in production mm -hmm. the cost of natural dyeing in production the storytelling around natural dyeing in in one's brand 
was fascinating to me. And so that's like, I'm just totally hooked on that working with a lot of the designers. Cause I'll, I'll, I do as much as I can with designers who fill out our project intake form until I can't do any more. And then it goes to Kathy in the, in the team for actual dyeing. But sometimes Kathy and I will, will actually get on calls with designers and be like, this is turning into a little bit of a hot mess. Let's walk you through it. Let's make you feel comfortable. It may be a fit for you. It might not be a fit, but let's just talk about it on the phone. Yeah. And I want to get into those questions about process, storytelling, marketing, um, just high level. Like how is the, your process or just the general process of natural dyeing different from, let's say, like industrial dyeing or wet processing? And again, like why is that? Why is it important to consider natural dyeing over these more traditional dyeing techniques? Um, so, you know, we use a, a lot, we, we don't use as many ingredients as they do in a, a traditional commercial conventional dye house. So, you know, because the dye technology for natural dyes is fairly um, ancient, like people have been doing this since we started just wearing clothing is trying to figure out how to put color on clothing. Mm -hmm. So the ingredients are fairly simple. The techniques are, you know, we use more advanced techniques just because we, we had practice doing it, but the basic concept really hasn't, hasn't deviated that much from kind of how you do natural dyeing in your own kitchen or your own studio, as opposed to doing it on a larger scale. Um, so we're, we're cleaner that way that we just have fewer ingredients, um, fewer inputs and the process itself pretty much is the same, except we don't do as much post processing as, um, a conventional just because we don't, we don't really need it. I mean, I guess you could use those same ingredients with, um, natural dyes, but I always feel like, you know, it's not really, um, it, it's not in the spirit of natural dyes, in my opinion. So then we try to keep it minimal. So it's sort of more minimalist. It's um, it's it's not really any longer in duration. But I think where we, Amy and I both see when Amy was sort of talking about the project intake form, is that many designers that we work with have never had the experience of trying to figure out how to put color on fabric. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is that if you're a designer who's working with what's conventionally available to you, you just go to your fabric supplier and you say, I want one of those rolls in this color, this weight, this pattern, whatever. You're not thinking about like, what kind of dye did they put on it? What kind of finishes on that? You know, is it, what does it have? What, what how was the fab fiber raised? Was it um, humanely raised? If it's an animal, was it organically raised? If it's a, um, a plant-based, you Maybe designers will go, oh, yeah, I want organic fabric, but they don't say, oh, I want organic fabric and I want naturally dyed and I already know how conventional dyeing is so I can make all these connections. So that's why we do a lot of education with um, a, a client up front. And, and for most of them, it's a pretty much a, a new process. Like they've not had to think about that before. Mm -hmm. And so there's there is training, training yeah. information and, and um, just sort of setting expectations. Sure. Amy, can you tell us more about that process? Like if a startup or a smaller brand comes to you to work with you, what is the process of like getting started and um, what can they expect? Okay. Well, they, they fill out a form um, and it's basically, it's the, I feel like it's really kind of nuts and bolts, the who, what, where, when, you know, how many pieces, how many colors of those pieces? What is the fiber of each one? What are the colors that you're thinking of? We have a color standard form that we'll, we'll send out so you can see the range of colors that Kathy has created. We can match colors though too. If you have some kind of a, you put together a little mood board and we get the general idea of it or there's a Pantone mm -hmm. then we'll, we'll be able to work towards matching that. Um, a lot of people will say, I need this in one month. Absolutely not. Um, that is like almost impossible with the way that we have things scheduled because you first have to do color development. So once you, once we agree that we're going to move forward with you, then we're going to do color development with you based on those colors and based on the different fabrics. So all those fabrics 
gets sent to Kathy and the team and they do the color development on it and then send it back to the customer. And if they approve those colors, then we go forward into production. And it's all, yeah. And that, I mean, like, that's the basic, that's the basic way. Yeah. Is So tell me a little bit more about color development and like, are there, I'm assuming there are dyes that you know work better with certain fabrics. Like what mm -hmm. does that look like? So typically what happens is we just have a range of, of colors that we know that we can replicate on pretty much any fabric. And the things that we look for in terms of quality is, is the color, is the color that the customer choosing, is it fairly robust, um, you know, against daily living people mm -hmm. will, um, you know, they'll be out in the, we don't want them to wash their clothes and have, no color come out or color stain other things that we work really hard to make that not happen. So um, we look at color and we look at like historically, how is this color used? Is this a good color to be using with this fiber? If that's the case, then this is, you know, these are the, these are the shades that we recommend. And, and then once the cu customers come to us with Oh, you know, often we just get a mood board, which is really helpful because the customer will say, well, I'm looking for this and you can kind of see what, where they're, they're going with it. And at that point we can say, okay, these definitely, we can match this. If you wanted this color um, here, here are the um, challenges with that. If there are any challenges or we can get you to this color, but it has, you know, these ingredients in it. And so we just want to make sure that how you're going to use it, like if I'm using it for an outer jacket that I'm never really, I'm going to wash maybe once or twice a year, kind of outer coat thing that might, that might ask, that might tell us that, oh, we probably could use these colors just fine. It's not going to be heavy use, like maybe a camisole or something that right. would go through weekly washing. So in terms of like, um, the, just like, I guess, best practices or best pieces mm -hmm. of advice for smaller brands that are mm -hmm. interested in incorporating natural dyeing into their supply chain. Like what are some major things to consider or just, yeah, again, kind of you like the best pieces of advice you've kind of learned over the many yeah. years. <laughs> um, well, definitely having an open mind about what the potential is. You know, sometimes we get like we're working with a designer right now who is just amazing to us. They're they're very high end. Um, they do most they started as a menswear line and now they're incorporating uh, women's wear as well. But the designer just has the barest outline of it, of kind of what they want. And they'll send us a few pictures and we'll, we'll all sit around and look at it and puzzle over it for a bit. But then we start just kind of brainstorming with the designer and saying, okay, is it, is it this? Like they're doing a lot of patterning with us. So it's a lot of handwork as opposed mm -hmm. to putting stuff into a dye machine and coming out with a hundred t-shirts. So these are one-offs, more one-offs, but I, I feel like the, the, the work working relationship is really good because they understand that there are some limitations and we're really upfront, like, okay, we can do this th color, this pattern, here's the limitations we're seeing. And, you know, they're just really open to, okay, we can work with that, no problem. And then can you do this? And so then we'll look at that and we'll try, you know, we just keep building on top mm -hmm. of what the idea is. And that's really helpful because they're, they're excited, they're committed, and they're flexible and they're they understand open, yeah. they're very open and they also understand that if they want hand work done like if we're hand tying or hand stitching something for them that they need to add more runway for us to actually do the work mm -hmm. because i can't do that in a week i might be able to do it in two or three weeks but i can't do it overnight mm -hmm. for them and they're they're totally okay with that so i would say for any designer um, whatever the time frame you have, I would add some time onto that because the more time we have to kind of exchange ideas and understand where you're headed, the more that we can respond with something that I think you'll be really pleased with. 
Amy, let's talk about um, marketing and messaging, which you kind of hinted at earlier. What have you seen as kind of like the most effective way to market and message, educate the consumer around the use of natural dyeing, maybe why it's more expensive to the end customer, all that stuff? Yeah. Woo. Well, during the pandemic, we've had, it's been like not so much a huge shift, but a fairly large shift in and what designers are asking us for. I'm sure Kathy would agree on that. We have a lot more people coming to us asking about where the, where the dyes are from or are they vegan or what's the carbon footprint? Or we have, we, we do the bulk of our dyeing in Seattle where Kathy is right now, but we also are working with a dye house on the East coast. So we have people who are really interested in, because we have a lot of people in New York and on the East coast, who would like to keep their carbon footprint a little smaller mm -hmm. so we'll, we'll, we can do that. We can help them now. And then the West coast people can, can do Seattle. If you're doing Indigo, absolutely. We're just going to be in Seattle. Mm -hmm. But um, so that's been interesting to think around that and why these things are really important. Why is made in the USA so important to you? Why is uh, women owned businesses important to you? Why are mm -hmm. us farmers? Why is it that that seems to be the lead for your story? And, so, well, so working with that, it's actually very easy. Once, once the designer or the brand knows where they want to go in terms of that storytelling with, with whatever it is about natural dyeing, like we can really help them with that. And um, I don't know, I guess there's just kind of is coming to this point, I think in sustainability and fashion, we have to really start upping things a bit with what we're doing you know, asking where things do come from. Natural dyes are are kind of the next level, I feel like, of all this. You can get your fabrics, you can get your cut and sew, you can get your production, you can do all this stuff in the US, but it's the people that are coming to us, which again, there's a, the bulk, there's really like startup designers coming to us. I, Kathy, you'd say, right? Mm -hmm. Really, it's like kind yeah. of young designers that are coming to us. We do have the Eileen Fishers and the larger right. brands that are coming as well that are every year. Like we're about to launch a whole Indigo collection with mm -hmm. Eileen Fisher. I think it's next week. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, yeah, so there's. So, but, yeah, if I could just interject, like we've worked with some really huge brands, you know, brands that come to us and say, we want to do 20 to 30,000 pieces. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, we would love to be able to do that. We don't have capacity today, or we probably do now have capacity, but we didn't a couple of years ago. And what I find with those brands, I mean, I feel like they're well-meaning, but they really haven't, they don't really have a sustainability story mm -hmm. that they can support. And, mm -hmm. but they're really interested in, um, I would say, signaling to their customer that they are sustainable. Mm -hmm. um, so those <laughs> folks for us, are, <laughs> they're a little trickier to work with because we don't speak the same language at all. I mean, oftentimes I'm working with a, a mill overseas, which is fine. I mean, I've done a lot of work overseas in it, both in Asia and in Latin America, and it's always been a really great experience, but it's definitely a different philosophy about, you know, why you're doing what you're doing. They're mm -hmm. trying to capture kind of this moment that they feel is trendy. Mm -hmm. And this is what we do. I mean, we don't do synthetic dyes. Sometimes people will ask me, well, can you just do this and this? And it's like, well, that's the, those are the characteristics of a synthetic. Mm -hmm. We could try, but you know, it's going to be a little bit different. So I don't know anything about synthetic dyes. I couldn't do synthetic dyes if I tried, but natural dyes we've been doing for, for a long time now and you know we 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 know we know if we have a fabric and a color and you know this process that we're going to get this this shade and and that's mm -hmm. what we do so mm -hmm. it's it's kind of weird it's kind of like you're so siloed in this one specialty that the rest of the world when you when you wake up and look around you're like whoa what are what are these guys doing but we are communicating and we are getting there but it is really different with a large brand. Mm -hmm. Is there, um, I guess, like an ideal number of pieces or yards that you like to work with to start? You know, we've, we've done, 
we typically with a lot of our customers are under 500 pieces okay. and, and that's totally comfortable for us. Um, but we do have larger accounts, which will be between like 2,500 to 5,000 pieces. And that production, we have to actually do at a, a different facility because of, of just uh, capacities. But that's fine. That works fine. It's, I think it's more when, I, when it's like this huge development group that is, you're working with who then hands you off to a die house that I just feel like I sort of lose the connection there. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> um, do you, I'm going to open it up to questions from anyone who is currently here with us live. So please type them in the chat. Um, in terms of uh, fabrics, are there any fabrics that you are like types of fibers that are particularly uh, responsive to, to your dyeing processes? Oh, sure. All natural fibers, mm -hmm. any even natural manufactured like um, Tencel or Modal, those are all optimal for natural dyes. Right. Um, microfibers that are polyester based and any polyester or acrylic based fibers, they don't dye very well at all with natural dyes. Yes. I was going to say, I, I thought you were going to say those were I good. Know, like, I, uh, yeah. Was, yeah. <laughs> Where okay, there actually has been some work. There has been some work with, um, um, PLA type plastics, so plant yeah. based plastics and mm -hmm. natural dyes. And I've seen those, um, they've used them for like interior panels and things like that. And they work great. And then mm -hmm. I've done a project where I've actually worked for a, um, a custom light lighting manufacturer and we've sandwiched natural dyes, uh, in between these recyclable laminates and that works fine. You know, okay. we've, yeah, but it's not exactly dyeing the plastic. Right. The first example I spoke of, the, the plastic is dyed. It's okay. super interesting. But wool yeah. and silk are like, they just eat it up. They love it. Yeah. And, um, flax like and silk. cotton, mm -hmm. flax, cotton, hemp. They, yeah. they, they, they do so well just, wool and silk. Uh, right. I would say for designers, I know that cotton is the most accessible fiber for everyone, mm -hmm. but it actually is the trickiest one to dye. Um, even linen and hemp dye more easily than, than cotton does. Interesting. That's mm -hmm. super interesting. Um, Teresa asks, is it preferred to dye the fabric before the garments are made or piece dye after? So it's preferred to do garment dye because we, that's the machinery ha we have. If you, you know, as you begin to dive into the world of like putting color on cloth, you begin to quickly find out that there's fabric, there's fabric that's dyed in the yarn and sometimes in just the fluff, the, 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 um, like the wool raw or the cotton before it's spun and then it's spun. It could be dyed in the yarn. It could be dyed in the fabric and it could be dyed in the constructed garment. So we're able to do the constructed garment portion of it. And we can also do very short lengths of fabric, but, you know, a lot of times if you're working with a sewing factory and you give them a two or three yard length of fabric, they, they can't really work with it. So it would be someone who is on a very small scale that we would be able to um, do fabric yardage. Yardage. But yeah, we're talking two to three yards and, and shorter okay. um, because yeah. we don't have the equipment to handle larger lengths. That's for like people have like maybe baby like slings for babies or mm -hmm. underwear or bandanas, you know, bandanas, yeah. something mm -hmm. like that. Yep, mm -hmm. that makes sense. Um, Aaron asked, "I'm a surface pattern designer and love colors, so I'm really drawn to your company. Do you do blends?" You so oh, that was a great question. The answer is yes. So I that's how I was trained. I was trained to blend all colors just using basically the powdered concentrates, which we call extracts. So we have natural dye extracts that are in a powdered form or sometimes a liquid form. And you can blend all of them in order to make a dye solution, a very strong dye solution. And then you can use that for printing and painting. Okay. You can also layer all colors on top of each other. If you do like block printing, you could do that as well. And just a plug for our blog, if you go and like, if you just do the, um, whatever, the little looking glass and it'll, it'll come up product 
and then blog. You can do two different searches. If you search the blog for any of the questions you might want to put even in the chat today, you'll find them on there. It's just, it's like a library. The Our website yeah. is incredible. And we have YouTube videos too where, I mean, it's, we have something that we do call Feedback Friday. Every Friday we have a presenter come on and talk about things, but we mm -hmm. definitely have had some surface design folks come on and you would see their videos and learn about them and how they That's do it. Great. That's yeah. a great resource. I'll have Hannah um, type that in the chat, the link uh, to bot botanical colors. And then if you just go up to the little search, the little looking glass, you can type in your question. Um, a question that was sent in advance, um, can you ombre dyeing with natural dyes? You absolutely can. I mean, ombre dyeing, um, it depends on the color um, and it depends on your technique. So if, if you're doing something with airbrush, you know, like basically you're spraying it, you can definitely do that. You would, you would need to experiment to see which dyes work the best with your own equipment because you have a really fine nozzle and the dye molecules that we're working with are tend to be larger than synthetics. So you, you might need to either strain your um, dye solution first, or you might need to use a, um, a nozzle with a larger, um, you know, be able to spray larger particles through. Um, the other thing is that if you're doing indigo, you can actually suspend um, your garment or your fabric over the vat and then just continually dip it until you get that beautiful gradation. It's, it's a bit of a specialty technique, mm -hmm. um, but it is possible, sure. And then um, Oscar also asked, I'm considering natural dyes for my clothing. The fabric I'm using is Sapima co cotton. Uh, does this fabric retain colors very well? And what fabrics go well with natural dyes as far as color retention, which we, ta we talked about that already, but any thoughts on Sapima yeah. cotton? Um, Sapima dyes beautifully, you know, it tends to be processed, it's combed, so it's super lustrous. Um, they may even mercerize it, which means that they kind of burn off all the little extra fibers that are sticking up on the yarn. So it's really a beautiful fabric. Uh, yes, you can, um, it, it dyes, it just dyes really well, mm -hmm. I, I found. And to Aaron's question, um, I guess this kind of leads to another question. Do you provide the fabric or the designer comes with the fabric and you just dye whatever fabric they have? We, unless they're looking for like a basic t-shirt, we have a couple of suppliers that we really yeah. like for t-shirt kind of things. I mean, mm -hmm. literally t-shirts. Yeah. Um, if you have anything else, you come to us with your garment and with then the garment we will dye it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, so Erin, um, your ideal fabric blend is tencel, lyocell, and merino wool. Do you have this blend? So you would need to source that fabric, get the piece cut and sewn. It would be a finished piece, and then it would be taken to botanical colors for dyeing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. You know what's good to mention too, Kathy? I'm, I'm thinking um, those garments too, if they have zippers or have trim or buttons mm. or the threads like if they're cotton thread but yeah synthetic thread maybe talk about that sure so polyester thread doesn't dye so unless you want that contrast on your garment um if you had a a, a thread that's either 100 percent cotton or um polycore cotton wrap that'll work just fine for strength um we've had a couple of customers that have given us garments with like super heavy we, like we did a bunch of puffers for a client and it had these monster zippers on it that had a hook on it and I knew that in in processing the hook was going to start slashing the fabric mm -hmm. so we actually had to tape all the the zipper heads in order so that they wouldn't do that so if you are able to if you're looking for some really unique interesting hardware that you want to add to your garment if you can possibly keep it off the garment while it's going through the dye process and then attach it post dyeing. Two things. One is that sometimes the metal reacts with the fabric and it'll leave a mark. And so you'll get these black marks all over your fabric and maybe you didn't want that. And then the second thing is the slasher. You don't want it to be um, <laughs> cutting all your, I mean, it, 
it can be a mess. So yeah, you want to avoid that. You yep. put a lot of work into these things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is there anything else you, either of you want to add? I want to also do a call out for if someone did want to learn more or work with you, best way to uh, go about following up. I'll add a couple things in, in yeah. here. I think one of the, you had asked before, like what are, what are ways maybe, I forgot the exact question about people, designers getting involved. Mm-hmm. I think it's really important for, if you, if you're interested in natural dyes to do some natural dyeing yourself, just to see mm-hmm. what the process is like and get your hands dirty a little bit and, and go through the process of how you scour a garment, how you mordant a garment, you know, a garment or a piece of fabric, and then how you get the color on it and just see how, how difficult it is or how easy it is. Maybe it's, you know, maybe it comes easy to you, but just to have an appreciation for it. And then, so when the, you do come to somebody like us or you, that you want to have a, a run of something done, you, you're not asking for something that, that's almost impossible to do. So you're a little bit more educated about it. Um, and yeah, I think, like I said, on our site, we do have lots of information. We have, uh, we're, right now we just partnered with the University of Washington and, they're, and this incredible group this master's class and they're helping us do our entire website. So yeah. we're going to be making it. So it's, so it's really easy, a lot more easily accessible on how to get this information and how to, you know, what are the sustainability facts for each die? So it's going to be really, really helpful for designers to utilize the site. So stay tuned for that. But right now we have a how to drop down that tells you how to scour, how to morden, all these things that are really, really important to understand as a designer on um, how color gets onto fabric. So, yeah. 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 Um, the other thing I would, uh, I would encourage everyone to do is, and Amy just briefly mentioned it, is that there's an organization called Fibershed mm-hmm. that's, that um, exists there. They were founded in Marin County, California. And their whole um, focus is they're trying to bring together um, growers, carbon sequestration uh, techniques, um, and the ability to create and manufacture textiles in a region. So Amy happens to live in Massachusetts, which historically was a huge textile production area. Um, some of you may be in the southeast of the United States, and that was that is also a huge production area. Or Los Angeles has a lot of um, cut and sew and production. But like up here in the Pacific Northwest, there's 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 people that have sheep, there's people that are growing flax, but there are no production facilities here. So we're we're using their model, and I think what's really interesting for all designers is that if you just start looking at where your fiber shit is and what they're doing or connect with Amy. Cause she's quite, um, she's quite an advocate for them. She can start connecting you with resources and farmers and people that you can actually go and meet and talk to and really get a sense of, wow, this is what's happening here. Um, is it something I want to do for my brand? And the North face did this with something called the backyard hoodie which was cotton grown in California. Um, It had to be spun and knit out of the state, but then everything else was done in state. And, you know, it was this within 200 miles of the headquarters of this company, they were able to get all the resources they needed in order to create this product. So it's very interesting to begin to look at that and say, is that something that could revolutionize and set my brand and my practice apart from others? And just, so I'd encourage you to do that. Just to throw something exciting in, I actually just launched a toolkit for fiber sheds and brands last week. We're, we're launching it through Fiber Shed in like two more weeks. We're just kind of waiting for Earth Month and Fashion Revolution Month to sort of mm-hmm. simmer down a bit. But it's a really helpful toolkit. It's about 45 pages. One whole side is if I'm a fiber shed, which I also run a fiber, Southeastern New England fiber shed. If I'm a fiber shed and I want to work with a brand to do some small run of something. How do I approach a brand to do that? Like I, I want to do something locally with, which I did somebody called with a, a brand called Gamine Workwear. And we put together yes, I love them. Yeah, yeah. Like this um, vest that was all made in Rhode Island and Massachusetts. 
and from wool from Rhode Island as well. And then the other side of the book is if I'm a brand, large or small, how do I go to a fiber shed and say, I want to make a 20 sweaters, regionally made sweaters or a regional dye. Or so, a beanie or sock. So it's yeah. such a cool, like, yeah, it's such a, in, but it's got a, it's all organized really well, beautiful images. We had eight case studies, people ranging from Mara Hoffman and our anonymous brand that I wish I could say who it is, but it's like, a, I'll just say a large footwear and apparel brand that might be based in Massachusetts. Ooh, um, but and then we have smaller brands and fiber sheds, but it's sort of, it's got a little bit of everything. And at, at the very end, there's also contracts, templates for um, MOUs, NDAs, uh, project intake form. They're all blank. So you could use them if, you know, if you are a brand that wants to reach out to a, to a fiber shed. But one of the things I think is really important, Shannon, yeah. As, a, as an aside, it's really important for brands to understand that there has to be some type of an agreement or a contract with the people that you're working with. Mm -hmm. Sustainability people aren't all good people. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to have these understandings in place. And that's what I feel like the fire, like I really wanted the toolkit to also have so that we all know what we're getting ourselves into, whether you want to do a run of sweaters of, dyed indigo or you want to do something that's um whatever or flip it around well it's, yeah, yeah it's making sure you're on the same page like mm -hmm. it's in writing i i harp on this so much in factory 45 oh, but even if it's not an official contract right away it's that you have it in writing and you know on both sides what the expectation and the deliverable is it's, that's right the point. like so important. important so important so important yeah yeah, yeah. And well, the better that, you know somebody, the more you need that too. <laughs> oh, it's okay. I'll do that. I'll, you know. Yeah. Nope. Mm -hmm. We have some stories from them. some really well-known natural dyers that we totally respect. And Ooh. we just happened to be connected with them this, this past week. And, you know, just talking about like, oh my God, you did that? Oh, you know, because you, you know, like, oh, you're never going to get paid what you think right. is worth or yeah it's yeah. it's a mess yeah, yeah. so always good to be clear is kind clear, <laughs> clear yep. is kind. um well that is an awesome note to end on too because i'm excited amy if you can follow up with me when it does go live and i'll share the link in with the factory 45 community it's um, live right now so i'm gonna okay. yeah yeah you can post it in the chat or um email me and I'll make sure that we, we all get it. That's great. Um, thank you both so much. This has been you're very, very welcome. Real pleasure. Yeah. Um, I'm so excited about the work you're both doing and it's so needed. And um, anyone who does uh, want to follow up or is interested in learning more, go to botanicalcolors.com. Such a wealth of resources and knowledge. Um, but thank you everyone for tuning in live. Thank you again, Kathy and Amy. And I hope you thank all you, Shannon. Have a wonderful thank you, audience. <laughs> See you later. All right.